Good afternoon. My name is Robin Goddard. I am a volunteer in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and have been for 50 years. I do the program at Little Greenbrier School and I also do a lot of programs on the Walker Sisters. So I'm looking forward to sharing with you today my experiences with the Walker Sisters. They have taught me and I'm one of their main cheerleaders in spreading the news of their legacy and what they did as far as living in this area and being a part of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. As you look at these pictures, I'm going to talk to you about who's in them and, and a little bit about what they represent. This picture was taken about 1918, and you will notice that uh, John N. Walker is on the left-hand side. I'd like for you to look at his cane. It, it's a handmade cane that he made, and the chair he's sitting in, I'm sure he made it also. Um, this is a picture of John Walker, and he is sitting in his chair, eating, I'm sure, the cherries that came out of his orchard. The basket, which is split oak, he made also. The uh, orchards around his house contained cherries and plums and peaches, but the biggest orchard was his apple orchard. Let's go back to this. The apples were all different kinds. He had 20 species. So anytime you see a picture of John, they called him Harry John, and you can understand why with his beard, he is sitting with either an apple or with cherry. This is a picture of their home. Now, Wiley King was Mrs. Walker's dad. And he lived in this house before John and Margaret Jane moved in. The house was built by Wiley King back about 18, in the 1850s. So as the family grew, the house had to be enlarged. And Bryce McFall, who also was in, associated with the property, had a cabin and Mr. Walker took some of the boys down and disassembled the, ca the cabin, brought it back, and that's what the kitchen and the porch are built out of. It's, this house is about 20 feet by 22 feet, and the kitchen is about 18 feet by 27 feet. So it gives you kind of an idea of how big it is. This is Hetty and Luiza, and her, her name is Luiza, not Louisa. She would get upset and correct you if you called her by the wrong name. Hetty was a knitter and was known for the wonderful uh, food that she cooked. She also would always tell the story about knitting stocks for a nephew that was serving in World War I and how uh, she bet that he was the only nephew in Germany that Stocks that were grown on an old mountainside because you see they sheared the sheep, carded the wool, spun it into yarn, and then she knitted with it. And was known for kind of a jack of all trades, but she loved to write poetry. And she was the one that was noted for so many, many poems. This is their mountain farm. 
you can tell it's it's a back view and it gives you an idea of how the, the farm was planted even though it was much larger than this picture shows um, the in the foreground you will see the where the beans have been growing up some of the corn and back where I believe that looks like one of the Caroline's daughters, but you will see that there is a great harbor and they had grapes and Concord grapes and also muscadine. But the, the area encompassed 122.8 acres and a lot of the area was farmland. They grew flax, they grew cotton, they also grew every kind of vegetable you could think of and they had pumpkins but the pumpkins were in mounds at a different place they had potatoes just everything that a self-sustaining farmer would have this is Louisa churning butter it was a very common picture uh, on the porch you will see Hetty is in the back, you don't see her, but you can see Martha more towards the steps. And Louisa made butter very often, and it went into a crop, was kept in their spring house. So the um, butter was delicious on all of their homemade items. This is a picture taken um, by Jim Shelton, who was married to the only sister, Carolyn, and it was taken around 1918 after an earthquake. He's up on the scaffolding, Jim Shelton is, uh, repairing the chimney where the rocks had fallen out of it. This is Caroline. This is a sister that married. Out of the seven girls, there was only one sister that married. And you will see her quilt with the tulip pattern in the back. They made many, many quilts. Um, the children are Effie, Phipps, John is in Carolyn's lab, Hazel Henry sitting with no shoes on, and Leona, the other one. There were four children. Now, this is another picture taken in the Tremont area showing the chestnut. This particular chestnut is hollow. And Jim Shelton again took this. Caroline is on the left, Johanna on the right. When they left and the tree was still standing, they took the tree down. It was hollow in the middle and they used it to store dirt in when they built the railroad up near Spruce Flat Falls at Tremont. This is a picture of the girls when they were younger. And this picture also was made by Jim Shelton around 1909, I believe they said. Uh, if you'll look carefully, it's Margaret, Blue Isaac, and Polly on the first row. And the second row is Eddie, Martha, Nancy and Caroline. Caroline is the one that's on the right that's so tall. She's the one that married. This is a picture of Louisa and Margaret hoeing. And you'll notice the bonnets. They were uh, very persistent in their bonnets and they had seed bags tied around their waist. All of the um, plantings were seeds that were heirloom and they kept them from year to year and they had magic i used to say they had magic hose because everything grew here's louisa picture of her you will see her seed bag up close this is a picture of their corn crib now a lot of people think that it is a barn but it's not it is a crib for keeping their corn, which was a staple item. 
um, the door you see opened and the corn was kept in there. There was also a hen nest. Now the sides were used for wagon and farm implements uh, that were around. This is another picture of Louisa home in her uh, garden. This is the spring house. This is the refrigerator. This picture was taken about 1936. Now they're, the, all of the greenery has grown up around it, but it's still there for visitors to see. It held large crops of milk and um, it had eggs and they would put things in there that like if they um, had extra pork that, that needed to be kept cool, they would keep it in the spring house. The spring is behind the spring house. Water bubbles up and then comes down through the overrun, overflow to keep everything nice and cool. This is a picture of Lou Eisen that was taken by Jim Shelton, who was married to Caroline. And she, uh, it shows her before she became more mature. Here she is churning butter again. Polly sitting on the, the porch. Now, on the inside in the big room, now the porch is through the door where Polly is sitting. That's Hetty on the right. And you will notice the coats hanging in the corner. Behind the door are the, is a ladder that goes to the upstairs. The boys slip upstairs. The girls slept in the main room with their mom and dad. And when I went out and helped them with all their chores and things, I slept in the trundle bed that's there that's on the left and you pull it out and, and leave it in the middle of the floor. So the, the beds, there were five beds that were in that main room and the sixth one was the trundle bed. Everything hung from the ceiling. They, you can see on this particular picture, they used newspaper to wallpaper the, the walls with, and it brightened up the room a lot. They also used magazines to do that. This is a picture of Louisa, Martha, and Hetty. They are ginning cotton. Their dad made the gin, and we used to laugh because Lou Isa used to tell me that it took three people to work the cotton gin. I can't imagine growing cotton on these rocky mountainsides, but they grew it because they used it for batting in their quilt, quilts. They said it took one person to feed it, one person to turn the handle, and the other person to tell them what to do. And we know that it took two people to turn the handles. This is a, a, a close-up picture of the cotton gin. And that looks like Hetty's hands feeding that cotton. Now, this is Hetty knitting socks that they sent overseas. Hetty was not real healthy and uh, she died really before I knew her. Uh, she died in 1947 and I was still very young. So I, they told me about her, but I just, I don't remember her as well, but I heard a lot of good things about her. This is Hetty by the fire sign. You'll see the other beds that were not in the other picture. Their um, old rifle used to hang up above the fireplace. Now, this particular fireplace is six feet wide. And I can remember as a child that there was always beans boiling or they were just simmering, supposedly, across that. This is another picture that, that's related to the cotton gin. Uh, that's Martha now. She's um, known for being the accountant of the family. She 
kept all of their records and she had a perfect, they looked like spreadsheets, her records did, and she would order things from Sears and Roebuck catalog for them. But she was known really as keeping order as far as their finances went. This is another picture of the big room, uh, and that is Martha with the broom, homemade broom. You will see again the newspaper on the wall. They did cleaning every spring. They would stall the walls. I thought it was the silliest thing I'd ever heard of because they'd have me out there pulling all the newspaper off. But that's how they did their spring cleaning. And then they would make a paste of flour and put it on the walls. Then they would put the newspaper and the magazine back. I can remember when they had um, wallpaper examples and we went to patchwork and then we went to, to real wallpaper. And uh, it was quite an occasion when we had to go out clean the walls down so that we could wallpaper and put up the spring again. This is Louisa. Louisa was my favorite. She uh, loved to laugh and she wrote all of the most wonderful poems. Um, I guess the one she's most famous for, she's famous for a lot of them, but the one she's most famous for it's called My Mountain Home. And we'll uh, listen to that in just as soon as we look at a few more pictures. This is another picture of the house. And it is, uh, I think, probably a reverse picture. You will notice the yucca plant on the right hand, bottom right hand side. Almost all mountain homes had yucca somewhere and they would use it to make twine out of and to make threads out of to uh, I'll tell you what what I remember about Walker sisters using it we would take a piece of twine and string green beans on it called leather bridges beans we used a, a, a uh, fishbone for our needle and we used a piece of yucca thread to hang them. We threaded um, red peppers also. And we would hang them on the porch to dry. If it was raining, we'd take them in and hang them by the fireplace. Another picture of, of Hetty. Now, these were the girls that, that lived after the park was established. Polly is on the left, then Margaret, in the middle is Hetty, then Martha, then Louisa, and the little boy is either a nephew or a, a neighborhood child that they kind of took care of off and on. Um, I'm guessing it was probably a nephew because the boys had big families. Now, this is a picture of the beginning of the Saturday Evening Post article that was on April the 27th, 1946. The Saturday Evening Post was the most widely read magazine in the United States at that time. So when John Maloney did this article, it kind of put them on the um, level of being a movie star. All the people that would come to the to the park would be excited about getting to meet these old ladies that lived like they did in the 1800s. However, they were not old ladies to me. They were wonderful people. Um, the article is also in color, which was unusual at that time. In the upper right hand corner, you'll see um, four of them with the uh, some of their quilts and cover ups. The spinning wheel in the bottom right hand corner, 
uh, Martha, who is carding wool, and Margaret is standing beside the spinning wheel that their dad made. He made uh, just about everything. And the upper left hand corner is a picture of them sitting on the porch, and you'll notice the pumpkins that are around and their dog Wimpy. He was kind of a collie breed and they uh, loved pumpkins. There's a story that goes along with that. Their dad fought for the Union and was put in Andersonville prison before he married their mother. And a Confederate went by, felt sorry for those Union prisoners and threw pieces of pumpkin over the fence to the prisoners that were in being held during the Civil War. And Louisa used to tell me, if it hadn't been for pumpkins, we wouldn't be here because their dad would not have survived. He was able to eat pieces of pumpkin. The, the story goes that he lost a hundred pounds in 100 days. Well, John Walker was a small man, so if he lost 100 pounds, I don't believe he would be walking around. But uh, they had beautiful pumpkin mounds. The pumpkins were not grown in the garden. They were grown other places in the yard. They would have decorations around them. They worshiped pumpkins all the time. This is a poem that uh, Lou Lysa wrote on thoughts of her mother and the spinning wheel. It's not one that you see very often. And I thought maybe you would like to, uh, to hear it. And it really expresses their love of family and their love for their mom. It's called Thoughts of Mother and the Spinning Wheel. Back to my childhood, my thoughts often still. To my mother's gentle footsteps as she turned the old spinning wheel. In from the winter with its cold rain and snow, my mother used to spin in our home so long ago. By good warm fire and a pine knot light, she would spin many yards of thread at night. Mother's chair is now vacant, though I dream of her at night and miss her in our home, she always made so bright. Louisa wrote wonderful poetry, and this would, would be one of them. Another picture showing the girls in front of the, the house, Louisa would. This is a note that Eddie wrote to one of her nieces. Now, I remember that not only did Caroline have four children, the boys had big families, eight, nine, ten children each, except for Dan, who had no children. And this uh, shows their address, Rural Route Number Seven, Sevierville, Tennessee. It was written in October of 1906. Miss Mary Jane Walker was the niece. And I believe her dad was uh, John Henry. It might have been William Wiley. I can't remember which one. Dear niece, I would like to come to school. And I have come to school every day. I was glad to get your letter. And you must be a good girl to try and learn if you are going, and I think it's, she meant to say, to be a school teacher. Your aunt, Hetty, Rebecca is what the R stands for. Hetty Rebecca Walker. So that's a, another item that is in the archives. Another picture of Louisa in front of the, the porch, and this I'm sure was taken after Martha died. Martha died in 1951. Louisa and Margaret were left in the home. So this is a picture of Louisa. And this is the last picture showing 
Luisa, someone visiting with them, and Margaret in the wheelchair. Margaret was the oldest. This picture was taken the year that she passed away, which was 1962, and she was 92 years old. Luisa was, um, she lived to be in her 80s. So she was 82, I believe, when she passed away. Um, I want to share uh, a few things with you about the Walker sisters and why I, I knew so much about them and love to share their stories. And when I do anything on the Walker sisters, I always tell whoever I'm speaking to that I tell you how it was when I was there. It doesn't necessarily mean it was that way when other people were there because things change. But Miss Elsie Burrell, who was a school supervisor in Blount County, which for those of you that don't know, that's the Maricopa area, was best friends with the Walker sisters. She lived not very far from us and she never married. She was a caregiver, a school supervisor. She did a lot of volunteer work and she, asked my dad if I could go with her to help do things at the Walker Sisters. They needed a lot of people to help them do their work as they aged. So from the time I was about four years old until I graduated from high school, I went with Miss Elsie to the Walker Sisters. I worked and I worked and I worked. It was not my most favorite thing to do, but my dad do you good. So I would go and spend weekends. I would spend at least a week around Christmas time between Christmas and New Year's. We would help with the carding of wool. I would go and spend time in the summertime with canning and pickling and carrying crops the sauerkraut to their spring house. It was not my most favorite thing to do. And I never dreamed that I would be telling you about it. But it is fun to reminisce about what happened in the past. It is wonderful to be able to tell you about the Walker sisters. The Walker sisters were a family that were lived in what is now the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, but we had lots of families. We had over 6,000 people that lived here before this became a national park. We had 6,600 tracts of land that had to be bought in, over, in order for this to become a national park. Well, this was around 1924, when land started uh, being talked about. And then as it got closer to the time of it becoming a park, there, a certain amount of money had to be raised. It involved two states, the state of North Carolina and the state of Tennessee. And as land was appropriated, some people sold their land and, and had no problem with it because it meant that they could raise their standard of living. For you see, most people that lived here were self-sustaining farmers and they were happy to be able to move and with some kind of financial help. But then on the other hand, there were many that didn't want to move. And it had been in their generation for some of them for two and three decades. So they were very resistant to a park coming in. And as we tell the story about land appropriation, we say it was about 50-50. You had 50% that sold without any problem and you had 50% that were very resistant. 
Well, needless to say, the Walker sisters were in the ladder. No government was going to get their hand. They weren't going to save it anyway. So they kept on living as they had. And eventually, the statute of limitation ran out. Eminent domain was in was uh, there and condemnation of their property happened. And then a man from Washington that was with the National Guard Service to their home to see if he could convince them to sell. They still were very negative and he told them that they needed to converse with a lawyer in which they did and they wanted at one time $15,000. But of course that wasn't gonna happen. And as uh, time passed on, it was 1940. The park had been established in 1934 so they didn't have any choice but to sell. And in 1940, their land was bought 122.8 acres for $4,750 with the understanding that they would be able to live on that property until the last person in that family passed away. Now, I need to explain to you that money paid for land and for deeds to be turned over to the federal government for it to become a national park were only involving land owners. So if you were a tenant farmer, you didn't receive anything. You only received compensation if you owned the the Walker sisters continued to live there using all of the methods of farming that had been done back in their dad's day. It was all they knew. They went to Little Greenbrier School. They went through the sixth grade. Two of their brothers went to school in Wears Valley and also went to high school and a couple of years of college in Sevierville, um, John Henry taught at Green Brock School two different sections. And another brother, who was the youngest of all 11 children, Giles Daniel, went to Idaho. He was married, but as far as we know, did not have any children. There, Nancy died in 1931 before the park was established. She knew that there was talk of a national park, but she did not, she had asthma and was uh, known as a wonderful seamstress. They talked about what, that she could make uh, satin stitches and you couldn't tell the back from the front and the same with making buttonholes. But she, uh, she died and I, I never knew her. I didn't know the boys. Uh, they were, were not around when I started going out there. We uh, had wonderful memories of what went on. I want to tell you some of my stories. One was uh, on the weekends and this would have been in the 50s and early 60s. We would make fried apple pie. And the girls had two wooden cook stoves. The flues went up the chimney in the kitchen and they had large cast iron skillets and they would have it filled with two or three inches of lard. And my job was to take the top of the lard can and cut circles so that Miss Elsie and Lou Isaac could spread the homemade apple butter. And then we would fold them over 
and Luaza would crimp them and put we would put them in the lard. Margaret would watch it. She had a long turner that her dad had made, and we she would turn them. There weren't wasn't a magic timer that told you when to turn. She would turn them and they would be beautiful golden brown. And they would sell those to the tourists that would come for a quarter or 50 cents. When it was holiday season, a lot of times they, if they had time, they would make apple stack. They would sell those to the tourists. And I can remember Jim Shelton, who was married to Caroline, saying he had never tasted that good as what they made. Um, sometimes we were in talking about what they sold to tourists when they came out to visit, they would sell quilt squares. They would sell um, little toys, swimming diddles, that were children's toys, and rag dolls. And uh, Louise's poetry, of course, was something that was very, very popular. 25 cents, 50 cents, nothing was more than a dollar. Another thing they sold was really small baskets. Um, their dad was a basket maker. And they had these little, they looked like children's baskets or even smaller that they also would sell. They had good uh, canning season. Sometimes if they had extra things, uh, vegetables, or if they had extra preserves, they would sell those also to the public. Their home and their style of living was truly a living history museum. Visitors from everywhere wanted to come, especially after the article that had been in the Saturday Evening Post. Um, the park was very lucky to have them because it was like uh, living history in people could see for themselves. They were very cordial. They were happy to, to be around other people. Blue eyes sometimes would, when she'd hear a car, she'd run down and, and greet them and invite them to come and visit. But in 1953, um, there was only two of them living because Martha had passed away. They wrote a letter to the park superintendent asking that they take down the little signs that showed where the Walker sisters lived because they didn't have time to do all their work, to make souvenirs for the tourists. And besides that, they were getting too old and the people that would come and visit would expect them and they wouldn't have them. But at the end of the letter they wrote, come visit us when you have time. So they loved people and I truly am happy of my experiences that I was able to have with them. I want to show you some other pictures that um, you might not have seen before. This is a picture of the entire family except for uh, some of the wives. It shows the mother and the dad and the boys and all the girls and uh, we're, we're very happy to have some pictures of the mother because Mrs. Walker was not um, very photogenic as far as taking people taking pictures of them. I told you that Martha was the accountant of the family. They loved hats. And this is a picture of Luiza with her hat on. They wore her hats on Sunday uh, to Little Greenbrier School when it was still being used as a church. And then when the park was established, they went to Hedrick's Chapel over in Wears Valley. They had quite a collection of hats. They also wore hats when they went over to Ridgecrest in North Carolina to the Baptist assemblies during the summer. Jim Shelton would usually drive. Another picture that uh, you might enjoy seeing is of Louisa and some of the flowers 
their mother loved flowers and they had over a hundred species of flower that had a thing to feed again. Um, Lou Isa loved to, to take care of them and to share them. One uh, thing she used to talk about all the time, people always wondered why they didn't get married. Well, they had a, a plant called Bachelor's Buttons and she would always show uh, whoever would ask about them, why didn't they get married? She'd say, well, we were really, we've been hoping, we've been hoping, and she'd show them the bachelor button flowers. This is a picture of Margaret uh, taking care of a rattlesnake that, was, that she was not real fond of, and uh, it showed you that uh, she relocated it. This picture, it was taken at, at really at the end of Margaret's life and Lou Isa. They were wonderful, wonderful people that were common women that lived in a very uncommon world. And I told you I wanted to share a poem that was very, very, very popular. This is the picture of the home place now that you can hike to. It's 1.1 mile from the parking lot at Little Green Bar School. And the name of the poem is My Mountain Home. It will, I want you to listen carefully because you will hear the dissension in the poem about the park coming in and taking over their property. My mountain home. It's an old renovating house. It stands near a wood with an orchard nearby. For almost a hundred years it has stood. My home in infancy, it sheltered me in youth. And when I tell you that I loved it, I tell you the truth. For years it has sheltered by day and night from the summer's sun's heat and the cold winter blight. But now this park commissioner comes dressed up so gay. This old house we're going to take away. They coaxed and they wheeled. They produced the barn. Saying we have to have this home for a national park. And for us pure mountain people, they don't have a care. They have to have a home for the wolf, the lion, and the bear. But many of us have a title and it's sure and it will hold. It is in the city of peace where the streets are pure gold. There is no line in its fury whose paths ever trod. It is the home of the soul in the presence of God. When we reach the portal of glory so fair, the wolf cannot enter, neither the lion nor the bear. No park commissioner will ever dare to disturb or molest our home that was there. It tells the story of how they felt. They were wonderful examples of how our culture in the National Park was carried on by their legacy. And as long as someone will tell the stories, then their legacy will live forever. Thank you. Questions? What type of clothes did they wear? What type of clothes did they wear? Well, they wore, in the wintertime, the clothes were called, are made out of Lindsay Woolsey, they call it. It was flax and cotton that was woven together to make a stronger 
material like linen, is the, what the flax was. And they grew flax, they grew cotton. We would pick the cotton and after it was gin, we would wash it in lye soap and we would hang it out to dry. And then we would use the two brushes. I don't remember if you, you saw Martha with her two brushes. And we would put one pile of cotton on one end of the side and we would comb with the other side. And then we would turn it and comb again. And Margaret, who was the oldest and very much in charge, uh, when I was a child, I was very afraid of her because she was so strict. And she would come along and, and feel of it. And she wanted it um, like cotton candy. She didn't want it to be rough. And then we would take it and twist and twist and twist and put it on the spinning wheel and spin it into thread or into, in this case, it would be spent into yarn and then put on their looms that their daddy made. and then. They would weave it into material. In the wintertime, it was it was heavy because the sheep, uh, you know, wool was was heavy material. They would wear Lindsay wool seat clothes in the winter and in the fall of the year when they needed the heat. And then in the summertime, they would wear gingham dresses and always had on an apron. And the gingham was store bought. They owned a sewing machine, probably the oldest one in all of Sevier County. It was the old treadle machine, and they had newspaper patterns that they cut their dresses out of. That's that's what they wore most of the time. They, their shoes were old brogan boots. Most of them were men's boots because they were much heavier and they uh, could be bought in, in the local store. When they were younger, they had a chestnut orchard, their dad did. And one of their jobs as children were to collect the chestnuts and take them down to the store in Metcalf Bottoms and sell them so that they had enough money to order shoes from the Sears and Roebuck catalog. Another question? Did they ever use any modern conveniences? They did they ever use any modern conveniences? You know, um, I always get a question about their outfits. They, people say, I understand that they never had an outfit, which is true. They did not. Their mother was very much against having an outhouse because she said that if she had to use the facility, when someone visited, then they would know her business. And you know, I mentioned people absolutely do not want anyone to know their business. So she said, we will not have an outhouse. The girls used the woods that was on the lower part of the property. The men used the woods that was up behind the barn, which was on the upper side of the property. And many, many people offered to build them an outhouse. And their response was, when we want an outhouse, we'll ask for one. Well, that carried over to the girl's life. And Margaret, who was named after her mother, Margaret, carried on that tradition of no outhouse. They had no indoor plumbing. In the wintertime, they used um, chamber pots, each one responsible for their own for uh, purposes. And they had, uh, as far as taking a shower or a bath, they had a big tub that they would haul water in and heat it outside. And as far as um, taking a bath in the wintertime, that would be brought into the probably the kitchen area. Um, no modern conveniences that I know of. They used to be visited a lot of times by antique dealers and they would offer them lots of money for their tools. And I can remember Martha telling me that she told them uh, we would have money if we sold our tools, but what would we use? We would have nothing to work with. So 
their tools or not. So, another question. Any related to William Walker, who lived in Tremont and had lots of children? Were they related to William Walker, who was also called Black Will Walker, who lived in Tremont, who had 27 children? He had um, one legal wife and two common law wives. And uh, as far as their relation to him, I can tell you what I've been told. I'm sure that there's many theories on that. The, they were supposedly married and double first cousins, meaning that Blackwood, which was the Tremont William Walker, and John Walker, who was the Walker sister's dad, married Myers girls. And we know for a fact that, that John Walker married uh, the King daughter because it was the King property before it became the Walker property. But they lived two different lives entirely because the Walker sisters' daddy was extremely religious and he was a Primitive Baptist. Um, William Walker, who was the Tremont, Black Will was also Baptist and he was missionary Baptist. And they did not agree on their so called morals. <laughs> so there was a relation, but I'm just telling you the stories that I've heard. Another question What year did the park uh, buy the houses out? What year did the park buy the houses out? Uh, the Walker sisters' house was bought in 1940 with the understanding that they would be able to live on that property until the last sister died. I would be surprised if the Park Service had bought the property if they had known how healthy those girls were because they lived in that house um, a long time after it was purchased. The last sister died that lived in the house was Louisa. And she died in 1964, which was 40 years after the park was established. Well, 30 years, excuse me, after the park was established. Another question? How many brothers did the Walker sisters have? How many brothers did the Walker sisters have? They had four brothers. Um, the first two boys, the oldest one was James Thomas. And the next one down was William Wyler. And then Marta was born. And then John Henry. And then the girls were all born. And the very last child, the 11th child in the family, was Giles Daniel. And he did not pass away until 1971. But he did not live in the house. He lived over in Weirs Valley. What next is, question. What is your favorite memory of that? What is my favorite memory with the Walker sisters? Well, my favorite memory probably is the wonderful food that we used to have. They were wonderful cooks. And we always had these giant meals at lunchtime. And they always had, they, because they had a lot of sheep, they had mutton, which was lamb, and they had a lot of pork. I remember as a child uh, collecting some chestnuts because the chestnut blight did not bother one of their trees and we would have, we would put chestnuts in a trough we, before they would kill the hogs um, after the first frost. And when we would feed that old hog, they had wonderful uh, hams and bacon and that they seasoned all their food with. But I, I think another memory I had of them was they sang old harp or shape note music. And I love to hear them sing. They had very high soprano voices. So as a child, I really knew almost every song in our shape note book by the shapes rather than by the words. 
And that was a memory that I'm thinking about. Another question. One more question. What happened to their belongings? When the last sister died, the house was closed for a while, and the Great Smoky Mountain Historical Society, I think it was called the History Association, it's now called uh, GSMA. They're the, the group that um, is so wonderful at, with for the park, along with friends, and they're also uh, also responsible for all of our uh, educational items that we have, the brochures and all of the bookstores that are at the different visitor centers. And I do need to take this time now to, to thank Micah Day, the librarian, and GSMA for helping me with uh, some of these pictures. But the, the uh, artifacts were bought the Great Smoky Mountain Association, and they were uh, put in climate control area, first in a bridge, and then when the Preservation Center was built in Townsend, they were moved to Townsend. And exhibits are held at different places where you can see their quilts and many items. I encourage you to, to look at some of them because it really shows what it used to be and what is carried on today. Thank you again.